Thank you, thank you very much, and welcome everybody to the um, to the international technical webinar on uh, soils management and restoration. So this is um, one of a series of webinars that um, FAO, the FAO eLearning Academy, is organizing with Agrinium, which is a network of twenty uh, institutions plus uh, with um, the UN ESCAP, which is the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific. So we, uh, for, for 2020, we have uh, um, planned a series of technical webinars on a, a variety of thematic areas um, related to nutrition, food systems, climate change, uh, um, a number of, um, of thematic areas of interest and today we are going to be covering the area of soils management and restoration. Uh, the idea of these international technical webinars are really to find a space for uh, exchanging experiences and sharing with each other um, knowledge and experience and and for this we are inviting a number of, of professionals throughout the world university professors uh, un officials U united nations officials so we, we are trying to to bring uh to the space a number of professionals throughout the world <coughs> so uh today i am extremely pleased to um give the floor to my colleague uh, Feras Ziadat, who will be talking to you uh, specifically about uh, the, um, the webinar today. I also wanted to invite you all to visit the FAO eLearning Academy. It is a multilingual platform that offers uh, free of charge a number of eLearning courses that are uh, on, on the various thematic areas that I mentioned before. So um, we, you have the link here, uh, and uh, so please try to visit the, the FAO eLearning Academy. Uh, Feras, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christina, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good day for everyone from everywhere. This is very good chance, and thanks, thanks for the organizers for organizing this important uh, webinar. Um, we are going to talk today about the climate change um, and how it impacted the uh, agricultural productivity and food security. And of course, uh, agriculture here is uh, a source of uh, emission and uh, it's a victim um, affected by uh, climate change. And uh, we would like to see uh, what kind of challenges and opportunities uh, we have. <clears throat> Uh, climate change uh, adaptation and mitigation is very uh, important and uh, there is a role for sustainable soil and land management to play and uh, we would like to see uh, how uh, different practices uh, on sustainable uh, soil and uh, land management will help in uh, promoting adaptation and mitigation uh, to climate change. <clears throat> uh, the process uh, we follow is an integrated process coming from the selection of uh, best practices. Uh, how do we select these practices among a variety of uh, practices uh, from technical point of view? And then how to provide the conducive enabling environment that will help and support the implementation uh, in suitable areas. Uh, and then uh, the monitoring of uh, uh, these practices uh, and other uh, environmental aspects of implementing uh, management practices in different environments and then uh, how do we look at the impact assessment uh, and how these practices are enhancing food security and uh, creating uh, enhanced uh, adaptation and mitigation to uh, climate change. So the issue is uh, uh, the, the objective of this webinar uh, is to look and present uh, the impact of climate change on soil and land resources, and then uh, to look at some land management practices that will help us uh, in tackling land degradation issues, uh, and then what are the tools uh, that are used to support the implementation of sustainable uh, soil and land management uh, measures. Um, I would like to bring to your attention, as Christina mentioned, uh, that this uh, webinar is also uh, uh, 
documented uh, in the Climate Smart Agriculture Source Book, and uh, especially in module number seven, which is looking at sustainable soil and land management for climate smart uh, agriculture. Uh, and there is an e-learning course uh, dedicated to look at sustainable soil and land management uh, in climate smart agriculture. Uh, and I welcome you to look at this e-learning course and uh, to go through the presentation. Uh, finally, I would like to welcome uh, the two speakers to this uh, webinar, uh, Professor Claire Tenou, uh, Director of Research uh, at the French uh, National Institute for Agricultural Research, ENRA, and Professor Bandi Zdoli, uh, Senior Research Scientist with the Mediterranean Agronomic Institute of Paris. Uh, CM bag in Italy. So by this, and uh, I will give the floor uh, to our first presenter, Professor Claire Chino. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to, to talk to you and discuss with you remotely. It's a honor so to present a seminar here. And I would like this afternoon to talk, talk to you about climate smart sustainable soil management for multiple uh, benefits. So we're going to talk about soils. Why soils? Because you all, you know, soils are absolutely key to life, to our human societies, because they provide ecosystem services. They provide, of course, they are first the, where plants grow, so there's where food begins, they're the provis uh, so provisioning food uh, service. They also host a tremendous biodiversity. They are, have an important role in the recycling of nutrients of our organic wasters. They have a major position in the water cycle, retaining, trans uh, infiltrating, transmitting water. They regulate or not erosion which is a major um, stress. They have an important role in climate change mitigation, and they also have cultural, they also provide cultural services. Uh, they are hosts of uh, remnants of for previews of our ancestors' activity, and they are components of our landscape. But there are challenges. Soils are important, but there are major challenges. First, um, well, you know, the challenges we have in our society now, energy sustainability, food security, water security, climate change, biodiversity protection, and health. Well, we are right in the health uh, challenge with this pandemic uh, crisis, and soils are related to every of these challenges. So soils do contribute to the sustainable development goals, zero hunger, uh, climate uh, change, life on land, and uh, clean water and sanitation. Soils are essential, but soils are in a poor state. Actually, two important reports, one by the Technical Panel on Soils, um, hosted by the Global Soil Partnership, and the other one by the International Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services established that nearly one third of world soils are moderately or highly degraded. So this is really a problem. And it is particularly a problem in the context of climate change, where you probably know what are the effects of climate change, the direct effect on land and on soils of increased temperature, of drought, of increased frequency, intensity, and amount of heavy precipitation, of sea level rise, they affect vegetation cover, but, and they affect several processes that correspond to soil degradations, permafrost thawing, loss of organic matter, especially the increased temperature, salinization, especially the drought, erosion, floods, coastal erosion. And in addition, the land managers, well, farmers, do implement management options uh, to ends in response to climate change. For example, they implement irrigation or increase the irrigation, or they would increase the surface area devoted to crop as a response to a decrease in yields. This also has effects on soil state and soil degradation, for example, on salinization and erosion. 
So a very complex picture, interactions between climate change, between land and soils, and between the managers of these land and soils. And a figure that I found very interesting in the recent report by IPCC on uh, climate change and land was that they, they were concerned with these big challenges, adaptation, mitigation, desertification, land degradation, and food security. And they mapped they, they made a map of the extent of these challenges and where they were, they were overlapping. And you can see that there is substantial surface area of our planet where several challenges occur simultaneously. So they must be integrated, they must be tackled in an integrated way. And the con one conclusion of this um, study of this report is that climate change exacerbates the rate and the magnitude of several ongoing land degradation processes and even introduces new degradation patterns. And this, they found it, it, they had a high confidence. So what I want to do today is to go to what could be the solutions. I will focus partly on soil organic matter. I will present you several management options and uh, discuss uh, at the end there um, the way forward, especially in terms of knowledge. So, solutions. I think that climate smart sustainable soil management is part of the solution. Sustainable soil management, um, well, soil management is sustainable if the supporting provisioning and regulati regulating and cultural services of soils are enhanced or maintained without significantly impairing either soil functions or the, either the sole function that enabled those services or biodiversity. And this is a definition that was provided by FAO. Now, regarding the current challenges of climate change, we considered that in a recent project, a uh, recent program that I, we are, um, I am strongly involved in, I'm coordinating actually, that um, this definition could give more importance to climate change adaptation and climate change mitigation. So we uh, stressed that we could use the concept of climate smart sustainable uh, management of soils. So let's go back to the definition of sustainable management. According to FAO, sustainable soil management aims to minimizing soil erosion, enhance organic matter content, foster nutrient balance and cycle, preserve and enhance biodiversity, prevent and minimize soil acidification, prevent and mitigate, mitigate salinization and alkalinization, improve, uh, prevent and minimize soil contamination, improve soil water management. Oops, let me try to, yes, that's better. Um, improve soil water management, prevent and mitigate soil compaction and minimize soil sealing. And we could add also adapt to climate change and attenuate greenhouse gas emissions. Now, one message I would like to convey to you is that soil organic matter is key to climate smart sustainable soil management. You probably know that soil organic matter comes from the decomposition of the plant biomass and also microbial animal uh, residues, <clears throat> that its decomposition leads ultimately to mineralization with several elements being released, and that organic matter is extremely heterogeneous, being made of plant residues or animal residues of alive organisms and of a range of molecules of very small particles, organic particles and a range of molecules. So a complex um, matter. A complex matter that provides ecosystem services, good soil structure, uh, it contributes also to water infiltration and retention, aeration, provision of nutrients, beneficial organisms that are components of the soil fertility. Now one example, one example uh, that comes from a meta-analysis made in China where you have plotted in the X axis, uh, you may see soil organic carbon stocks and in the Y axis in the first graph you have relative yields compared to, um, to a reference plot. Well you see that the yields increase before plateauing increase with soil organic matter and maybe most uh, original, more interesting is the second one where it is the interannual yield variation that is plotted against soil organic carbon stocks. 
So it is actually yield stability that increases with organic carbon stocks. So all organic carb matter and its main components, soil organic carbon, are important to food security, yields, and to their stability, adaptation to climate change. Soil organic matter also contributes to mitigate climate change. There are huge carbon stores in the soil. There is more than two times as much carbon in the soils than there is in the atmosphere. And hence, a very small variation of these carbon stores, even a variation of the carbon stores in the upper 40 centimeter of soils could have uh, strong impacts by increasing on the composition of the atmosphere, either increasing it or decreasing it. And this is the basis of the four per meal initiative, Soils for Food Security and Climate, an initiative that aims to promote the preservation of soil carbon and the increase of soil carbon, in particular in agricultural soils, for food security and for climate. Okay, so soil organic matter is important. Which management options to implement? Let me have, drink a little bit of water. <clears throat> I will present you only two examples. Uh, the next um, speech will develop much more than I will do. Uh, two examples of cropping systems. The first one is conservation agriculture. Conservation agriculture is reducing or uh, suppressing tillage. Oh. Reducing or suppressing tillage, maintaining a, soil, a permanent soil cover, either as a mulch or as live plants, and diversifying <coughs> the rotation. It has very important effects on soils that I tried to, sum, to, to show partly uh, on these uh, graphs and has important effects, consequences on the fluxes of carbon, nitrogen and water. Let's go back to what are the aims of sustainable soil management. Minimize soil erosion. Well, it has been shown and many studies show that conservation agriculture decreases uh, soil erosion, that it also enhances organic, the soil organic matter content with actually, and this is my upper table, very variable results uh, depending on the depth considered, depending on the um, climate considered. Um, and um, effects that are especially important when you have a cover crop that is living, that when you increase the inputs of organic matter to soil. Conservation agriculture has been shown in many studies to preserve and enhance biodiversity and to improve soil water management. And here I took an example from rice crops in India, where you can see, so I'm sorry if it's a bit complex, but you can see uh, the X axis is time and the Y axis is the soil moisture. And you can see that the dots that are black uh, that correspond to the situation with the mulch, conservation agriculture, the soil moisture is always higher than it is in the reference plots without a mulch. So, conservation, the presence of a mulch allows to preserve water and hence to better adapt to climate change. The second system I would like to take as an example is agroforestry. Again, very extremely variable uh, systems in different areas of the world. We here just illustrated with two photographs. Same approach, well, Agroforestry has been shown very efficient to minimize erosion very efficiently to enhance soil organic matter content. And here, my example is a recent paper where uh, the IPCC co coefficients for soil organic carbon storage uh, were revisited. And actually, the numbers of these very recent meta analyses are quite high. So, there's carbon storage in agroforestry in soils, not only in the trees, also in soils. Uh, agroforestry has been shown to foster nutrient balance and cycle, to preserve and enhance biodiversity and improve soil water management. And here, what I illustrate, I see that the quality of the graph is not that good, I'm sorry, is um, you have here, what is uh, represented in this recent meta-analysis is the number of studies that quantified an effect of agroforestry compared to cropland on macrofauna, the first block, mesofauna, 
and microfauna. And the positive effects are in, um, the papers showing positive effects are in yellow, though neutral in orange, and negative in black. You see that it's mostly positive effects. So agroforestry does preserve and enhance soil biodiversity in general. Now, if we focus again on soil organic matter and management options to increase soil organic carbon stocks in agriculture, there's actually a wide range of options that are available and that I will represent with photographs based on this simplified cycle of soil organic carbon in agricultural soils where you have the inputs and the outputs. First, uh, primary production can be enhanced with cover crops, with uh, greening or grassing uh, the interrows in the vineyards or orchards, with uh, temporary grasslands and with agroforestry. Fires can be, uh, can be canceled and this is an issue in several countries. Exports can be reduced and crop residues returned back to soil and exogenous organic matter such as compost, manure or biochar added to soil. This will increase the inputs to soil and then increase the soil organic matter stores. And other practices can reduce the losses by reducing erosion, so small infrastructures reducing erosion or conservation agriculture to reduce erosion and reduce biodegradation rates of the organic matter. So different management options and what really comes out very clearly from the literature now is what is most efficient is to increase the inputs to soils rather than try to decrease the outputs from soil. Ah, and agroforestry also. Well, you may have guessed that I'm working on soil organic matter. Um, and you may have a question that is, uh, well, can you do soil climate smart sustainable soil management with no major input, no major lever going through soil organic matter? Well, I think that yes. I think that yes, for example, terracing will reduce strongly erosion, but there's no direct effect on soil organic matter. Well, reduce erosion might help to preserve organic matter, at least preserve it in the field. And another lever that is promoted by FAO is the crop diversification. Uh, it has no, uh, no, there's no straightforward effect on soil organic matter, but it has been shown to increase productivity and to stabilize income of small holders in a climate change context. So organic matter is not the only lever, it's an important one. It is key to global issues. Again, here you have a report, um, a graph that I took from this IPCC special report on land, where you see the columns correspond to the uh, global challenges they addressed, mitigation, adaptation, desertification, land degradation, and food security. And the lines, correspond to the different response options based on land management they considered. And I would like you to see that one management options, option, increased soil organic carbon content has, is considered to have a high, a large effect on all of these challenges. So it's a good solution. And this explains uh, the occurrence with the existence of the FAO project, recarbonization of global soils um, that started a, a some time, uh, well, just I guess one year ago, and of uh, the Four Per Mill Initiative. And the Four Per Mill Initiative, so it's a multi stakeholder initiative, and they are essentially focused on uh, promoting and fostering uh, the input of uh, land management options and agricultural practices that help to preserve and increase soil organic matter by addressing policymakers and addressing farmers and the whole agricultural sector. Of course, uh, de depending on the area of the world, there are different priorities. In northern areas, for example, or in forests, the priority is to protect existing soil organic carbon stocks. While in other areas where the contents are poor and where it's a problem in soil fertility, there the priority is to try to increase from the level uh, at present. And also, I would like to say that soils with this photograph, these photographs, that soils are extremely diverse so uh, management options have to be, to be uh, tackled, have to be adjusted to the soil type. 
we are close to the end of my talk now. And I would like the way forward is a complex way where we need more knowledge. We need um, monitoring verification systems for soil quality, for soil health, uh, for the practices, for the management options. And we need uh, um, enabling conditions to implement those uh, climate smart, sustainable soil management options. I would like to give you one example, in fact. One example, and it is, uh, I would say it's a working document. Um, so in this European joint program uh, that associates 20 six institutes from 24 European countries. So it's a very large uh, programs. Our aim is to develop, to provide the knowledge, um, to provide the knowledge, to, to improve the knowledge, to develop climate smart, sustainable soil management. And for example, uh, regarding uh, the knowledge needed, well, the knowledge needed to optimize soil management for multiple services delivery, which we, I covered today, what you need, we think, is a good knowledge of the present status of agricultural soil. So soil information is extremely important there. You need a framework and tools to assess soil functions and their contributions to ecosystem services. And these can be go to identifying, developing indicators for soil quality and ecosystem services, defining target and reference values of the indicators, providing from that, based on that, soil management guidelines in the different agricultural and pedoclimatic context, provide developing ICT support, ICT decision support tools, and providing monitoring, reporting, and verification system, or the whole soil monitoring system at the national scale and at the European and international scale. What is also needed is evaluating the improved management options, while well, the climate smart sustainable soil management options, well, and um, the following talk will develop also on, uh, on this uh, topic and show the two examples and enabling conditions to implement these improved soil management options. And for example, while this is not a complete list, this is examples, um, we think that we need an assessment of barriers and opportunities. We need to examine, maybe to propose possible incentives and to do, for example, economic assessments of the benefits and costs of the soil management options. So research cannot be only biophysical. Research has also to have a political, legislative, social and economic dimensions. On this, I will conclude. So climate smart, sustainable soil management brings multiple benefits, I think, that are ecosystem services delivery, climate change adaptation and mitigation, reducing degradation and restoring soils and land. One component of this is soil organic matter and preserving and increasing soil organic carbon is feasible, but extremely heterogeneous, has to be spatially differentiated. Solutions have to be achieved locally and they have to be managed, they have been, to be devised um, and implemented locally. They have to be spatially differentiated. The contexts are extremely different, but they have global impacts, global impacts on nitrogen deposition, on uh, biodiversity, on erosion rate and particles in the air, and of course, on the composition of our atmosphere in terms of greenhouse gases. There's not a single good practice but an adequate combination of practices in a given context. And the context, again, is agricultural system, it's the soil type and the climate. An enabling environment is of utmost importance. Otherwise, there's no transfer from knowledge to uh, real life. And what, the, oh, I uh, erased the S, a systems perspective is needed to tackle all this. And on that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, we have uh, some questions in the question and answer. And uh, I, I would um, probably uh, prefer to, to do the other presentation because there are some uh, questions that might be answered uh, from the second presentation. And then we will come to some questions from the chat or we open uh, for some questions from the uh, participants. Uh, for now, I would like to move to uh, Professor Pandis Doli from CM Barry, 
uh, to um, uh, give his uh, presentation uh, on this topic. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Tara. Let me share my screen first. Okay. Okay, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, in about 20 minutes, I will try to give you some feedback on how we could combine these land management practices to tackle land degradation, and then what could be the next step, how to outscale them, make them available to other people who may be not aware. Now, as also Claire mentioned, we have some uh, disturbing facts in terms of land degradation. This report of FAO published in 2015 pointed out a number of uh, uh, things that are going, going like uh, Claire mentioned, 33% of the global soil are moderately or highly degraded, and most of that is due to unsustainable management practices. We lose on a global scale annually about 75 billion tons of soil. And if you convert them to how much it costs, we're talking about 400 billion US dollars each year lost in agriculture production. Uh, and then we also significantly, this reduces the ability of the soil to store uh, carbon. We heard how much important is this organic matter, for example, and nutrients and water. And you can also, try to figure it out how much is this damage, for example, from erosion. And we estimate that losses through that report are about 7.6 million tons a year. So erosion is a problem and many, many other problems like that. This is the only one slide on, 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 on let's say on bad things that I will show. And I'm showing this for a reason because erosion affects every place on earth. It used to, it's also an HR process by the way, and it affects about 25% of the European Union. So don't think it is only an issue outside developed countries. Uh, and sometimes it's due to unsustainable land management practices. This report, and Claire mentioned it as well, of IPBS came out in 2018. And again, some very disturbing facts, like land degradation impacts 3.2 billion people and represent an economic loss about 10% of the annual GDP. Uh, is a pervasive systemic phenomenon. It occurs all parts of the world, and I mentioned Europe in that regard. And restoring degraded lands makes sound economic sense because it could result in increased food and water security, employment, gender equality, and could avoid conflict and migration. Now, in 2018, was published also the World Atlas of Desertification. That was the third edition. Uh, I gladly participated in developing this product. And it opens with a very interesting saying, rethinking land degradation and sustainable land management. And that there is a saying by the uh, Mangari Mafai, a Nobel Prize, Peace Prize laureate, I guess from Kenya. And she says, when resources are degraded, we start competing for them. So one way to promote peace is to promote sustainable management and equitable distribution. By the way, all this, I had given the links and presentation will be uh, sent to you so you can uh, look in and link and then and, and find out more. Uh, this atlas, it's a mixture of maps as well as uh, text. And I will focus mostly on solutions. Now, Claire mentioned this, but this is also quite a good report, important report of IPCC on climate change and land. Uh, a summary for policymaker, and again, a number of disturbing factors coming out. Like, for example, if you see this one here, cropland soils, since we, uh, Claire spoke about organic carbon, have lost about 20 to 60% of their organic carbon content prior to cultivation. And soils under conventional agriculture continue to be a source rather than the solution. And we have to change it. We have to make it the, the, the soils as a solution to this problem. So we have a great ally, which is soil to mitigate and 
probably also to adapt to climate change. And what you see on the left side, this was developed, by the way, by the Global Soil Partnership. 2015 was the International Year of Soil, so many of these came out at that time. And you see on the, on, on, on the left side, on what, the, what is on the red, is all the bad things that we can do. Through unsustainable soil management, we can uh, increase erosion, we can accelerate erosion, we can compact the soil by heavy machinery. And, 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 and what we do is that we release the carbon up into the atmosphere and accelerate the climate change. On the right side are the good things you see on the green. And those could be achieved by sustainable soil management. And I will show you with practical examples from also my personal experience from some of the projects that have somehow achieved all what it is given on this uh, uh, right side of, of, of the slide. Now, soil protection and management stays at the heart, at least of the three UN conventions. We heard a lot about how important is the soil carbon sequestration for uh, climate change. Uh, and then uh, soils on themselves represent up to 25% of the total global potential for nature climate solution. And there was a paper just came out. It said the 60% out of 25 can come out if we implement sustainable land management practices. UNCCD, the Convention to Combat Desertification, is heavily involved in land degradation neutrality, and there is also economic of land degradation <laughs> initiative, and so is the Convention on Biodiversity, and we only know 1% of all the billions of microorganisms that are into the soil. That's why also there is a global soil biodiversity initiative. We have in Europe now the EU Green Deal, which is looking out at all these issues. And there is also a soil health and food mission, which is trying to uh, uh, put all the targets for the, for the next seven year period in the uh, European Union. So where to find this information? Now, I can't start this by mentioning without forgetting WACAP. WACAP is the World Overview of Conservation Approaches and Technologies. It's coordinated by the uh, Center for Development and Environment, University of Bern in Switzerland. And the first publication that came out, I think this Where the Land is Greener, was in 2007. And it, it, it was a big show. Here it is also a nice video. We don't have the time, but you can click and learn more. So practically, the sustainable land management can have a set of, 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 of good things that can derive out of that. Like you can protect the watershed, you can conserve the ecosystem, sustain biodiversity, improve production, and generate social and economic benefits. There are more than 1,500 of these practices from all over the world into the database of WOCA. So feel free, go there, and you will learn a lot more. So how to do this? I think we have to put people at the center of the actions, because that's what I showed are the big conventions and the legislation and the framework. But at the end of the day, there are the people on the ground who have to make this change. So that's why I'll try to do with some examples. It's like a picture can speak more than a thousand words. This man, uh, for those of my age probably know it, but maybe the youngers that are attending us maybe don't know, is Yakuba Sabadogo from Burkina Faso. He was called the man who stopped erosion and desertification. He, 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 he was kind of as a star invited in the COPS of UNCCD. There is also this video here, what Yakuba did next. So how he showed, he was in the Guardian, that is the, uh, the uh, uh, newspaper in the UK. So practically in these eye pits, how they call it, he planted these trees and he put his mulches and he put his organic manure, he put his cereals. He created a, an agroforestry man-made system, the first one. Uh, Claire mentioned the good effects that the agroforestry can have, and there are examples like that one, for example, in Konsa in Ethiopia, we have dual benefits for soil conservation and agricultural production, or the terraces, Panuya U terraces in Kenya, by the way, we are going to have both countries soon a project and we try to implement these practices at a larger scale. Uh, I give you another example, and this is quite interesting. If you see these pictures, you probably think that uh, we are somewhere, I don't know, moon or, or, or Mars. or uh, This is in the Matruh region, in the western desert of Egypt. And you can see this gully erosion. These areas are abundant. Wadi in Arabic, by the way, means watershed or a basin. So it was like that in 2013. And we started there a rural development project 
was coordinated by our institute in Bari and was funded by the Italian cooperation and we collaborated strongly with the Desert Research Center in Egypt. And that's what it became like this in 2017. 13 hectares all were reclaimed and it over to the Bedouin communities where they grow olives and figs and vegetables. And guess what? It was a successful project. And we also, as you can see, I'll tell you a little bit more on the water harvesting. And if at, and Egypt decided to invest more money and to rehabilitate something like 8,000 hectares of this eroded valley, that is, I hope they, they, they are doing it. Uh, so we published even a paper and, and, and very briefly I will go that if you see here, we are almost at the end of uh, July, also very dry season here in Ukraine. That 2016 actually was a bit wet year, but still due to this intervention, we were able to store almost 18,000 uh, cubic meter of water that otherwise those would have been lost if not for this intervention that we made. So, you do, but you don't need to look only at the flat layer. By the way, interventions like this, I know from literature and peer review papers that I, I also reviewed are implemented also in other parts of the world, but that, that's the case of, of, of Egypt in this regard. We, we didn't look only at the flatlands, but we look also on the sloping length of these ones. And then we built semicircle terraces and we planted this locally adapted uh, drought resistant, salt tolerant resistant crops that were used both for uh, feeding animals and I mean, people also use the Moringa leaves to, to, uh, as for consumption. But in the meantime, you start accumulating a little bit of carbon in an area that was totally dry before this intervention. But since we're looking at climate smart agriculture, climate smart agriculture is based on these three pillars, and FAO people know this very well. If you look at the center, you have to have the agricultural production and the increase in income. You have to help farmers build resilience and adapt to climate change and reduce wherever possible the greenhouse gas emissions. So at least with three interventions, you can see we even tested quinoa, a very unknown crop for, for that region. I think we were able to address all these three uh, pillars in that particular project. But you have to look at sustainability. It's not just one single intervention. So you need a land and water management, crop management, agro food value chain, and marketing a local program. Because if farmers have no place where to sell it, then it becomes a problem. You have to empower women and to have to respect also local tradition. And by the way, in this particular project, we did also implement this in that way. Now, there are examples also everywhere, and I'm very briefly will, will show you this. This is in Portugal, in Europe. We have here in Europe a European uh, Innovation Partnership in Agriculture, a network funded by the European Commission. And actually, we were visiting this farm in, in Santarém in Portugal. And this man in here, Mr. Coimbra, he has been growing for 20 consecutive years with cover crops, corn, with very high yield, and he increased soil organic matter up to 3%. These are all calculated data. So in maintaining soil health, improving soil health, and maintaining good yield, it could be done. And I'll show you also why not everybody is doing it. Uh, this man also is in Ireland, Mr. Fergal Burney. He converted his farm from conventional to or organic and by, by making a combination of various uh, crops that he's feeding his, his animals. And he says that, my, my fields are quite good and the quality of the meat is quite good and I'm making also good money. Uh, another example, since we are in Italy, I'm speaking from Italy now. Uh, this man, Dino Masala, you see what he did. This is in, uh, by the way, in Cinque Terre. This is a national park. It's a UNESCO property site, by the way, cultural heritage. These terraces, some of them were built even a thousand years ago, but he, he built 80, thousand cubic meter of drywall terraces in this very steep slope growing uh, grapes. He produced a good quality of, uh, of wine and he stays there and he was even in the news in the national television media. So let's move to the US. In the US they have the Soil Health Institute and there are many things that you can learn out of there but they produce this very nicely well done fact sheet on soil health case studies and uh, they, they, they directly spoken by the farmers. This is three generation of farmers and they look at soil health, economic, water quality, climate benefits, 
and so on. And I don't have a space now, but if you see on the next uh, part of this slide of the tax sheets, there are also data on economic benefits. So people also were able to make money out of this because a farmer is also a businessman. There's no question about that. So there are many examples like this. And here, let's go to China. And I've been uh, fortunate enough to visit this family in the Lanzhou uh, with colleagues from Lanzhou University. We are in the last plateau here. Uh, they grow potatoes and corn. And uh, actually, <laughs> I, I, we, when we visit with them, they, we, they offered us those very nice potatoes. That was uh, quite good for them. And uh, they, they also have pigs. They, they use uh, biogas for, for their energy needs. Also a very uh, simple done solar equipment. So quite, I would say, also self-sufficient in at least in some part of their food and energy needs. But there are thousands of factors like this in the last plateau, not only for growing corn and, 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 and potatoes, but also Chinese have planted um, um, millions of trees and they probably also are accumulating carbon in those areas. So the UNCCD has this land heroes campaign. And I was looking because it was just on the 17th, a week ago, the day to combat desertification, desertification day. And uh, they show that there are many other, these land heroes around the world that are implementing the, the, these practices. So how all these examples relate to climate smart agriculture? Now we said that FAO uh, described the three main objectives that the uh, climate smart agriculture can provide. You have to increase agricultural productivity, no question about it, and income build resilient to climate change and remove greenhouse gas emissions where possible. The issue is how to do this. And I don't think this can be done unless we endorse a multi-stakeholder approach where all what I mentioned, the UN organization and international development agencies and the EU as well, big player, NGO, civil society, private sector, and of course we need the academic institution and research to come all together and to draft this and try also to, to implement. Let us don't forget that there is also a global alliance for climate smart agriculture, if not mistaken, FL is coordinating this and brings together 260 members from a variety of, of, of sectors. So where to learn more and how to outscale some of these examples that I mentioned, uh, you heard from Christina that there is this uh, FAO of our e-learning academy was launched also officially a few days ago. And within the endless numbers of courses that are there, uh, we as the Bari Institute, together with uh, with FAO and Ferras, uh, his team, with uh, economics of land degradation, Mark Schauer were there, Lindsay Springer, the Wokat people, Hans Peter Lineger, Nicole Hariri, all these people, we came together and developed these five interconnected lessons. Here it is the the link if you wish to go there. And I'm sure that you will learn a lot because we call that one-stop shop on sustainable land uh, management and restoration. There is also this introduction to climate smart agriculture uh, that also you can find it within the FAO uh, e-learning uh, e academy. So there is plenty of places where information could be found. Uh, Ferras mentioned also, but there is also this uh, uh, sustainable soil land manual climate smart agriculture in practice and how the soil can try to fulfill at least these three main objectives that the climate smart agriculture uh, has and, and, and what, what I mentioned. So I'm coming almost to the end of my talk and the issue is how we could scale out all these uh, uh, management practices and there is an issue here because we have to look, what you see on the left side of the slide, it is the idea of we have to share the knowledge, okay. And I mentioned walk-up. Most often farmer learn from farmers. So there are these, oh, we call it influential farmers, but we also need that the researchers talk to farmers and the researchers have to talk to farmers based on reliable scientific data, on long-term experimental data, and there is also quite important that you do things by learning. Uh, there's a lot of talk since many years now on the cost of, uh, of, of inaction. 
So how much it costs if we do nothing? Or can we afford to do nothing now? Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, we have to, the, the farmers have to, and us and society have to reap the benefits, which include also environmental benefits. But to do all these things, we need to have a, a, a extension services which are effective that go straight and tell farmers what they need to do. You need to have a socioeconomic context and you need to have also political support. We need to have political support. I mentioned that cost of inaction is very linked, very much linked to the prevention than cure. So it's, it's cheaper to prevent than to cure a disease. Uh, then you need the capacity, institution, training and education. And I'm glad that I see quite a number of, uh, of, of students uh, attending today. So that's good for you. Uh, uh, the FAO revised the uh, World Soil Charter in 2015 in the occasion of the uh, International Year of Soil. And there are also the FAO voluntary guidelines for sustainable soil management. I would be happy that this from voluntary maybe become not legally binding, but more kind of say obligatory. Now there is the other issue that, okay, you have to do this thing, but you need money. And to do so, you need funding opportunities. I would say that there are uh, uh, available uh, a lot of options to figure it out where is the money. Uh, for example, here in the uh, EU, there is this DESIRA initiative, Development Smart Innovation Through Research in Agriculture. It's coordinated by the European Commission, DG DEFCO, collaboration with AGRI and RTD. And look at that, how relevant is this initiative to climate smart agriculture. The DESIRA seeks to enhance an inclusive, sustainable, climate-relevant transformation of rural areas of, and of agri-food system by linking better agricultural innovation with science and research for more development impact. There is the Green Climate Fund. There is the Land Degradation Neutrality Fund that UNCCD is following. There is the Jeff Land Degradation Focal Area that will go all the way to 2030. And in addition to that, there are a number of development agencies who are, like I mentioned the other case in our project in Egypt, with USAID, German cooperation, Italian, Japanese, the list can go even longer. And in many cases, that also say there is a private sector. So sometimes there is not only an issue of money. We did with Paris an assessment on, on, on the Mediterranean countries and sometimes there is money, but you cannot use that money for a set of reasons, including the, the, the socioeconomic and political context. So, Coming almost to the end, I pose the question, can then the soil maintain the ecosystem function and services on a sustainable way on the long run? I would say yes, but only through sustainable land management. And to do so, I give you a very practical example. I took this picture myself, it was in Sardinia in Italy in 2011, and you see this piece of land in here, it is the same slope, it is the same soil, uh, characteristic, physical, chemical, biological, whatever you want. But it is a big difference between all these three parts. There is almost no degradation here. A very few number of cows grazing. I don't see any form of erosion, no compaction either. Here, the farmer decided to plow up and down. And you see this rail. And maybe after 10 years, they have become gully. It would be nice to go and see what happened in here, but here, the degradation at that time, it just started, and it's almost all degraded. It's overgrazed, number of animals here, and there is not a single grass somewhere. So it's all about management, how we manage the land and, and then the soil, obviously, also the water. And how we discussed today about climate smart agriculture, and that's fine. But let's face it, that there is kind of, I would not say competition, but there are so many uh, names that moving around, like uh, conservation agriculture, Claire described that. Uh, in the US and Canada, they prefer much more to speak about regenerative agriculture. I was reading the other day a paper in Vogue, and even the fashion industry is producing cotton in India through regenerative agriculture, which is fine, perfectly fine. Agroecology was mentioned. Organic farming, I give you example. There is a term carbon farming. So Farmers are paid money for sequestering carbon into their soil. You can have precision agriculture. So there is a set of uh, technologies which are not that different in my point of view from each other. Important is if we implement them in the right and in the correct way. So 
uh, this is my last slide. I was showing this because it's quite interesting. This come from my home country, by the way, in Albania. And this is an area uh, where the soils are still quite salty. That's a line there. I, I, I surveyed myself about 20 years ago. And here now there is a farm with 500 hectares by a private businessman that many in here with some other people probably through implementing sustainable irrigation systems, sustainable land management system and finding the right crops. You can see we're talking about here uh, pomegranates and goji berry. Both of them are quite salt tolerant. So they are now in full production. Uh, they employed local people. You see many women as well. So people don't need to move to the city or migrate somewhere else where options are given like the example in Egypt that I showed, or even this one here, it makes sense. And it shows that things can be also done if we put together this holistic uh, combination of all stakeholders. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Hope I was within my time allocation. Thank you very much, uh, Randy, for this uh, presentation. Uh, I'm glad that we hear the two presentations. Um, now we um, shall move to the uh, to answer some questions. We have some uh, 30 minutes to interact with the participants, and uh, we have uh, a quite a number of questions in uh, the Q and A uh, bar. So um, I will give uh, first the floor uh, to uh, Claire if you have. Uh, picked any of the questions that you have, you would like to uh, comment on, or um, we can pick some uh, some questions because I, I don't think we will be able to answer uh, all questions. Uh, we will, if, if we missed any of the questions in the first Q and A bar, we will uh, at this uh, after the and try to answer uh, all these important uh, questions. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, yes, Claire, uh, please okay. go ahead. So basically, just a second, what uh, what Ferris was mentioning is that uh, all the, we will try to answer to some of the questions and uh, and then we will also prepare a document after yes. the, the, the webinar where, uh, where the experts, uh, Pandi and Claire, will respond to most of the questions. And this document will be available on the FAO eLearning Academy together with the recording of the event. So Claire, please, uh, the floor is yours to answer some of the questions that, uh, that you picked. Okay, well, there are many questions and many exciting questions and many challenging ones. Uh, so thank you uh, to all the attendees. Um, I saw that there, uh, maybe I will first pick up questions. I, I answered partly uh, typing, uh, but there are several questions about uh, the risk when you implement um, sustainable management options, such as conservation agriculture or agroforestry, that your yields decrease. Uh, so the answer from that is that it is extremely dependent, of course, on the context, but regarding um, conservation agricultures, quite often, well, at least publications show that uh, it's a temporary issue. Uh, time of learning, time to uh, learn how to um, master to control the pests, we, uh, time for the uh, earthworms to be back and to improve uh, soil porosity. And, um, but, well, it's there's a problem of this transition period. Regarding of growth forestry, it is true that when you plant trees, you decrease automatically the surface area of your crop the, because of the rows or the places where you have planted the trees. Yet there are two facts. First, and it was mentioned in the question, uh, it's an important option to choose um, trees that bring you some revenue, for example, fruit trees. And also there are situations where in fact, the yield per surface area is higher in agroforestry. And this is quite, uh, occurs quite often and has been analyzed in Mediterranean areas as well as in tropical areas uh, because of indirect effects of uh, recycling, of maintaining uh, the nitrogen at the, in the upper layers of soil or shedding uh, the crops. So 
yes, it's a complex analysis. So maybe Pandy wants to develop on that. I think maybe you could, uh, do you want to complement? Uh, well, I, honestly, I was also looking at all the questions that were made and uh, uh, the, uh, the topics are quite diverse. And uh, uh, of course, there is not a single answer that could respond yes. to, to all all what uh, uh, was was mentioned. Uh, for example, I have in here that uh, how small farmers in Africa can improve yield and preventing soil from erosion and degradation in small farms because farmers have small acreages. So, uh, of course, the size is also an important mm -hmm. factor if you how to, to, to implement that. The examples that I showed are some of them that are being uh, implemented also in, 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 in terms of uh, cooperation with various uh, development agencies, uh, which also provide the advice to farmers uh, through extension services, and they can also help to disseminate and to uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, enlarge and outscale these practices. This is, of course, it's a, it's a long process. It's not going to be done immediately, but it is also good to know that farmers learn from each other when they see that there are results. If they, if they, 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 they kind of, in the beginning, they, they will not accept immediately whatever technology is being offered. Uh, they want to make sure that if I change something, I need also to get the, 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 the benefit, I need to have uh, the income from my, my, my farm. And then of course, they'll be definitely interested to keep their soil healthy on, on, on the long run. So that's what I, I, I could add to the whole topic of discussion that is uh, uh, being given here. Uh, one question um, I also would like to pick up. Um, one of you asked, what are the easy monitoring and evaluation of soil uh, methods that a novice young farmer could use? And well, I think, and I guess Pandy will also have his opinion on that. What I would propose is what is named visual assessment of soil structure. It has been developed, I know a lot in Brazil and Latin America. There's also, it has been a lot, quite a lot developed in Switzerland, in the US. It's basically uh, taking a small volume of soil with a shovel and analyzing it. So you have a guideline and analyzing the porosity, the color, uh, the presence of earthworm galleries. So it's, it's very easy to, well, you do not need any equipment. And I think you learn a lot from just observing your soil using these, uh, these guidelines. So I don't know, Pandy, if you have what yeah, that, I, would you I mean, propose? Ago, even even FAO had developed a visual vision okay, for the uh, de defining the main basic soil characteristics. So those are are quite simple, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you 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 can use them without too much. Uh, I mean, of course, you need some basic training, but it is rather quick and and, and easy going to mm -hmm. identify what are the main basic soil characteristics that one can uh, identify in the field and make a kind of, uh, like you can look, look at the at earthworm, for example, the number yes. of earthworms yes. is uh, an indicator of, of, of soil health and many other uh, characteristics that are easy to, to, to look at. I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. and I think Thank you. Uh, many participants are asking about uh, certification and uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, on the FAO eLearning Academy we have a series of courses related to climate smart agriculture and also uh, water management, soils management. These courses are all related to the webinar of today and they are all certified through the digital badges certification system. So this is a certification system that certifies the acquisition of competences. It is a very, very valid uh, certificate. Also, especially now that the FAO eLearning Academy is actually the official uh, legal certifying body of FAO. So please visit the, the, the Academy and uh, um, uh, you can do the, the ones on uh, um, climate smart agriculture and soils. 
and souls management and um, so the, uh, that one you can get is associated the certificate is associated to the course and and you can you can get it and it certifies your competences um, so you have the links here also on the screen you have the link to the academy and to the courses and um, Ferras, would you like to add something thank you very much i'm sorry i was dropped from the call i missed yes. the discussion <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, I would like to add to the point that was uh, Pandi and Claire mentioning that uh, FAO is also uh, now uh, developing the soil doctor program uh, where people are trained how mm. to characterize yes. the issue, the problem, and then how to find some solutions, uh, which is based also in uh, some uh, robust but uh, easy and uh, affordable uh, techniques that will uh, be used. Um, that, that's just to complement uh, the comment. Uh, I, I find uh, I lost the question, about, but I have one question uh, which uh, probably uh, is, is important. Uh, the question is that no tillage agriculture is significantly important for soil conservation and save energy and labor. However, it has not been widely used all over the world. Uh, reasons and what could be done for it. I think this is a general questions for sustainable uh, soil and land yes. management that from technical point of view, we know uh, a lot of techniques and practices that have been tested uh, and evaluated in, uh, in different conditions. Uh, however, the scaling out of these at large scale is still uh, not as we, we want it to be in order to uh, to uh, really uh, enhance a tangible impact on land degradation. And this is uh, a challenge because uh, we have uh, knowledge, we have the needs, uh, but we don't achieve uh, a large scale implementation. And behind that, uh, both Pandi and Claire touched the enabling environment and all the whole process behind scaling out uh, these uh, technologies and the practices uh, that uh, there is a lot of, of um, uh, uh, requirements in order to make this happening from the knowledge, the training, the capacity building to the finance, uh, availability of uh, uh, resources to start this process uh, to the uh, also uh, to provide some evidences that this will work in different environments, uh, also to provide some decision support information uh, on the uh, su suitability and availability of these techniques. Uh, sometimes also the uh, willingness of the land users and farmers uh, to accept some kind of uh, compromise between productivity at the short run and sustainability at the long term. How do we absorb this and how do we help uh, through the sometimes the policies and regulations in uh, finding some solutions for the uh, scaling out of these uh, practices. Uh, there are some techniques and tools that FAO and partners are implementing uh, and uh, there are some uh, bright spots where we have some implementation of uh, these technologies, for example, in the Great Green Wall, uh, uh, in different uh, parts of Asia and uh, Central Asia. There are bright spots where uh, the scaling out and implementation of some technologies are gaining uh, some uh, uh, trust. Um, back to you, Christina, maybe uh, to, to um, manage the time and tell us what, what uh, yes. Now, just uh, thank you very much to all the presenters. Thank you, Ferras, for the excellent moderation. I also wanted to mention that we will be uh, designing and developing also a series of materials and e-learning courses on, uh, for farmer field schools. And I believe that all the resources you were mentioning about soil assessment and monitoring could be extremely useful to integrate in those materials and in that learning program. So it's important also to cross link and to uh, use different opportunities uh, to, to promote uh, all these guidelines and tools that you guys are uh, involved in. 
so I wanted to thank everybody for, for uh, the participants, for, for attending, uh, the presenters, the moderator, my colleagues behind the scenes, Sara Ferrante and uh, Fabio Picinic and Aristide Bucare from uh, Agrinium. And I would like to invite you all to visit us and to stay tuned because we, the 15th of July, we have our next international uh, technical webinar on forestry. So we look forward to having you there too. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.